Sean. Okay, we're live now. Okay. I'm give you 10 seconds. Hi everyone and welcome to this evening's event with the writer Rachel Louise Snyder, organised by the Bristol Festival of Ideas. My name is Sean Norris, I'm the director and founder of the Bristol Women's Literature Festival and also a freelance journalist myself. I'm just going to run through a couple of housekeeping things because this is a new platform for me, although hopefully not new to everyone here. Um, we're going to have a chat, me and Rachel. I'm going to ask some questions. We're going to discuss a lot of things about her book, No Visible Bruises, which you can buy using the link at the bottom of the screen. And every purchase will lead to a donation to the Solace Women's Aid organization. If you'd like to find out about more events coming up, you can subscribe to the Festival of Ideas newsletter. And this is going to be the first in a series of events looking at issues around women's equality around domestic violence, around the coronavirus, and how this has impacted on women. So I'm really thrilled to announce that we're chatting to Rachel Louise Snyder. I'm just going to check the bio at the front of the book to make sure I get everything right. So Rachel's work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New Republic, Slate, and elsewhere. Her other books include Fugitive Den Denim and the novel What We've Lost Is Nothing, which came out in paperback the same day as this paperback. She has been the recipient of an Overseas Press Award for her work on This American Life, and No Visible Bruises was awarded the J. Anthony Lucas Working Progress Award. And Rachel's also an Associate Professor at the American University in Washington, DC. Now again, just before we kick off with our first question, I wanted to raise the point that we are gonna be talking about domestic abuse, and some of these issues are gonna be quite distressing and maybe quite painful to some people in the audience. And for that reason, we just wanted to let you know that the National Domestic Abuse Helpline is open 24-7 and you can call them on 0808 2000 247. And we will be putting that number in the chat function should anybody need it. So that's all my intros out the way. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us. And I wanted to start off by asking you, what drew you to the subject of domestic abuse? And what kind of triggered this realisation that you explore in the book that we don't really understand domestic violence and domestic abuse? And this lack of understanding is what's causing so much harm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really heartened that events like these are still able to go on um, because, you know, uh, art and literature and, and craft is the language of the soul. And I feel like um, yeah, it's more important now than ever. Um, you know, I mean, the simple answer is my own ignorance drew me to the <laughs> to the subject. I had always done stories of sort of human rights around the world. Um, you know, I wrote about child brides um, all over mm -hmm. the world. I wrote about um, just uh, the ways in which women in particular are disenfranchised. But my focus was really global. Um, yeah. I traveled um, and lived overseas for, I lived in London for two years actually. Um, and um, it was really, when I moved back to America in 2009, I met a woman who was um, really a leader in the field of domestic violence. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's always in the stories I write about, but I didn't make any kind of connection. And she began to tell me, this was Saturday morning, I'll never forget this because she was going on vacation with family and her brother had sent her to the farmer's market to get, you know, all of the two weeks of supply. And she, as she started talking, I realized like I could not let this woman go. And so I went yeah, with yeah. her to the farmer's market and I was like, you know, carrying beer and corn and trying to take notes <laughs> at the same time. And she was saying things to me that were blowing my mind. I mean, the first thing she said was, we have created a program to try to predict domestic violence homicide before it happens in order to prevent mm -hmm. it, which sounded absolutely like science fiction to me. Um, she told me things like, well, when a, when a victim doesn't show up to renew a restraining order, very mm -hmm. often that means the problem is worse, not solved. Um, I had never thought about the fact that shelters or refuges, refuges, I think you call them there, refuge? Yeah, yeah, refuge. You're putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, the, you know, are really 
subpar uh, solutions, right? We're taking victims and children out of their community, out of their home. Um, so she just told me all kinds of things that, that blew my mind. She told me that strangulation was different in terms of dangerousness than a slap. And yeah. I just thought if I, you know, a well-traveled, educated, you know, privileged white middle-class woman from blah, 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 America didn't know these things, what was it saying about, you know, the, the, the like, what was it saying about how we were just simply not in tune to this? It was only later that I learned the incredible ways in which domestic violence intersects all these other social issues that we face, right? Like yeah. homelessness and in America anyway, mass incarceration, guns, all, you know, we'll talk about some of the, this stuff later, but you know, there's, there's just this, it's like the first line of entry for violence yeah. and we ignore it. Absolutely. We ignore it. And I think that's the interesting thing, isn't it? We, I, I mean, I don't know, particularly in the UK, we, we have such a familiarity with some of the statistics around domestic violence. It's, you know, we know two women a week are murdered by ex or current partners. And yet we repeat the statistics, but don't think about what that means. It's something we've just sort of accepted is happening in society. Yeah. Right. And, um, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that kind of is born out of this, these gaps in our knowledge or, I mean, ignorance seems like a judgmental word, but let's go with it for now as well. Mm -hmm. um, around like lack of communication, lack of services coming together. And a lot of the stuff you look at in the book is solutions based. Like how do we, you know, prevent domestic violence? How do we find these, these kind of trigger points when we could intervene? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those solutions and what questions we need to be asking. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my task in writing the book was... Um, I have hundreds of years of people not caring about this. Yeah. So how can I write a book in which um, if you are not standing at the receiving end of a punch, there will be something for you to relate to. That really became my, like my modus, my modus operandi, if you will. And so it was, it was really a question of like, well, I can't just write, a book that tells us how terrible it is. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we all have a kind of a sense of how terrible it is. So, um, so I wanted to write about solutions and I wanted to write about um, the things that different parts of different, you know, geographies might face a rural area versus a, a, you know, an urban area, for example. So I really tried to cover as much ground as I could. And what was so surprising to me was that some of the solutions were so simple. And I'll just give you one sort of crazy example. When I tell this to audiences, like they, they kind of laugh and I'm, I laugh with them because that was my first reaction. But so there's a woman in my book named Michelle who, Michelle Monson Mosier, you find out on page one that, that she was killed with her children mm. by her husband, Rocky. I'm not, there's no spoiler alert. You find out right away. Um, but what you also find out is that he was arrested. She called the police on him once, only one time, and he was arrested and she went and filed a restraining order, um, an order of protection. And as she was leaving the DA's office, having filed that order with an affidavit, um, his parents came and bailed him out. So he got bailed out. He probably spent an hour in, in you know, at the police mm -hmm. station in a holding cell at the, at the most. One of the changes that has been made in the wake of the murder of Michelle and her kids is that if you are arrested, um, this is in the state of Montana in the US, if you're arrested for domestic violence, you can't bail out before lunch. I mean, it sounds like such a ridiculous thing. What would that do, right? Yeah. But what that does is that it, it, the abuser, the person arrested can't see a judge until after lunch, which gives domestic violence advocates and victims three, four hours, however much time it is, to to make a safety plan. And what they could have done in Michelle's case, for example, is those three hours or four hours, that's enough time to change the locks. That's enough time to pack up some bags and get them to shelter if they need to get to shelter. That's enough time to install some security cameras, to get restraining order, copies of restraining orders for neighbors. Like there's all kinds of things that you can do in that amount of time. And so, uh, that blew my mind because that is a solution that costs like no money. I mean, yeah, yeah. 
you know? So there's things like that all throughout the book where I feel like jurisdictions can take these tiny little things and they don't have to ask for money and they don't have to, you know, increase their, their, you know, whatever employee base or something. They can just make those changes now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the really, really heartbreaking things that you talk about in the Michelle case, um, you know, which was really hard to read about, was, was this sense of, of how she was trying to leave, but actually doesn't believe that the system is, that, believing that, the, that her, part, her abuser is more powerful than the system. Right. And I guess those kind of small changes are signs that the system can be more powerful than the abuser. It's so true. That is one of the, I'm so glad you brought that up actually, because that is one of the critical elements, right? If you just dissect that moment, she she finally calls the police, right? By the time someone calls the police, you know that they've had years of abuse mm, in most yeah. cases. She finally calls the police. Um, the police come, they file a, a, a really, can I swear? Am I allowed to swear? They file a really shitty police report. Excuse my French. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you read part two of my book, you'll know that swearing is a you know pretty pretty common part of my vernacular. Um, uh, she so she finally dips into the system and she goes to the DA's office and she does everything she's supposed to do, and then he gets out. Yeah. So you just take that one little moment and deconstruct it, and you think, what are the hidden messages for victims? And the hidden message is that his freedom is gonna be prioritized over her safety. Yeah. This is what motivates victims to do what we think are irrational things, like stay with an abuser, right? Because the, the, the system has said, we can't hold him, we're not gonna protect you, you know, he's out in an hour. And so they, in Michelle's case, you know, she, did what, what so many victims do, which is to have a show of solidarity against that very system that she sought help from. She denounced the police, she yelled at them, she said, you know, just leave us alone, this is a private matter. We don't understand what we're seeing when we see that. So that was, that was what I was trying to do in my book, was like deconstruct those moments to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And I mean, that comes up again, doesn't it, with the um, the later case of, um, oh, I've forgotten the woman's name. I'm so sorry. No, no. Um, wait, I can do the Dorothy Gunter Carter. Yes, that's the one. I knew it began with a D, but I was going with Dante, which was the man. Dante. <laughs> but again, a similar sort of moment where, where you know, where towards the actions don't make sense. Why wouldn't you go to a refuge? Why wouldn't you go yeah. for shelter? But actually when she's looking at her entire context, who's who's keeping her safe? Who does she trust? And she, and it's not the system that's let her down. Right, she, Dorothy Gunter Cotter, had been in and out of shelters for 20 years in five different states. He found her every time or coerced her into going back for one reason or another. And so she finally said, I know he's gonna kill me. And when we're in a shelter, we're all in there together. My daughters and I were in run room. At least if I'm at home, maybe I can save them and he'll just kill me, which is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And that is the that is the case that started the program that the woman that I followed around at the farm yeah, yeah. was talking about. That was the very first thing I learned about. And it was it was stunning to me. Um, yeah. I think about Dorothy a lot. She she died in 2003, but I think about her a lot. I never met her, of course, but. No. I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's very hard to, to read the book. I mean, I, I found it a very challenging book to read because the stories are so upsetting. And, and I mean, obviously they're upsetting. They're about these terrible acts of violence. I mean, how did you kind of manage the process of writing that? Like, how did you delve into these stories and find yeah. ways to tell these stories? And did your creative writing background support you in, in that storytelling process? It did. I mean, I will say um, for anyone who hasn't read the book, there is there, there are a couple of people in the book who are funny and, you know. Oh yeah, there's a lot of laughter and a lot of light as well. And also incredible, inspiring 
activists and people who are making wonderful changes. Yeah. 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 No, I, sorry, I didn't want to make it sound like no, it was yes, like, it's so dark. It's so dark. I it's true. Um but it's also it's also very light. Um you know, the fact is, I mean, one day I will tell you, I'll be honest, one day I was writing, I remember exactly the scene I was writing and it was Dorothy Gunter Cotter. Um, when she was killed, her 11 year old daughter was the one who was on the phone mm -hmm. uh, with the police and she was hiding under the bed. Um, and uh, while I was writing that scene, I just started to sob like in yeah. my office, really physically sob. And um, I wrote to a couple of advocates I know, including the woman who started the program. And I said, I can't, like, I'm trying to write the scene and I can't even see my words through my tears. Does this ever happen to you? You know, and they like immediately reached out and they were like, yes, and self care. And, you know, yeah. um, I mean, it, it was really hard when I finished it. I was like, that's, I'm done. No more domestic violence, I'm done. And. <laughs> Here I am still working on domestic violence now and starting another book on it because I'm a masochist. Um, so, um, I mean, I guess that's that's the emotional side of that question. The The flip side of that question is creative writing, which yeah. really, I, I'm trained as a fiction writer. I have a, a graduate degree in fiction. I've never taken a journalism class in my life, even though I'm primarily known as a journalist now. And I really think that having a fiction background enabled me to write a book that, first of all, read like a novel. I mean, it reads mm, yeah. like a novel. Um, it's a very quick read, people tell me. Uh, but also because I had to ask myself questions like, if you know the ending of a story, if you know that Michelle's story is going to result in the death of her and her children, what makes anybody want to read that, right? <laughs> Why do you want to read that? And so I had to answer that question from the perspective of a creative writer, right? Yeah. Like, let's think of it as a movie plot. And if you know, if you're watching like the usual suspects, right, where you yeah, start yeah. the ending, and it's how and it's how you arrive at the ending that tells the story and that makes the story compelling and have tension and things like that. That really became how I looked how I looked at the at the book. And um, it's why, for example, when you open it up, the book is divided into three parts. And the first part is about Michelle, and it's called the end. Yeah, yeah. And the middle part is about abusers, and it's called the beginning. <laughs> and then the final part which is mostly advocates and change makers is called the middle. Yeah. And it, it's, it was so confusing when, when I was editing, I, my editor would be like, well, in the beginning, I'm like, wait, which beginning? Do you mean the beginning <laughs> or do you mean the beginning end? <laughs> but it's great. And it, and it's, and it really, un, you know, it does that unfolding and also incredibly strong sense of the people, the way that you write the lives of the, mm. the people that you're writing about is done with such a level of respect. But also, but they are so brought to life, and you, 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 you fit you. You're living with them when you're reading it, which is incredibly powerful. Yeah, you know, I had a, um, I had so Rocky, who killed Michelle, mm. killed his children, and then killed himself. His parents had never spoken to anybody, and they they did speak to me finally. And yeah. um, I mean, his father it was. It's still one of the most profound days of my life talking mm. to his father for seven hours straight. But his siblings would not talk to me, and um, his sister in particular. And um, I went to Los Angeles on my book tour, and she lives near Los Angeles. And she came with Rocky's mom. Rocky's mom came from um, Montana, met her in LA, and they came to my book reading. And she told me afterwards that um, when the book was sent to her, she didn't want to read it. Her mom sent her the book. She did not want to read it. Um, so she had her best friend read it. And her best friend said, no, no, you can, it's okay. You can read this. Yeah. She's fair to Rocky. I'm fair to Rocky. Um, and so she came to me and we were all crying afterwards after the reading. And she said, after I read your book, it was the first night I'd slept since he killed them. Gosh. Yeah. That's and, incredibly you know, powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was what? like, I was a puddle on the floor. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about the the beginning, the, as in the middle of the book, but the, the section that's <laughs> at the beginning, yeah. um, and it, because it, it is about men, and I think that's you know so often when we talk about domestic violence, we are understandably focused on the victim, 
and and less focus on the perpetrators and on the abusers mm -hmm. and i mean it's first of all um for, for people who are listening that haven't read the book the second section looks at a lot of prevention programs that are being done with men who have been convicted of of assault or violent abuse um but also looking at ideas around masculinity and i just found that analysis that you offer fascinating about how men learn to be men in our society and how that links to aggression and violence mm -hmm. and i was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about your research into offenders yeah i mean it was really important to me to get every voice in there and i think too often we we focus our focus is on victims and rightly so but we're never going to get to the root of the problem if we're always sort of dealing with it after it happens. So um, I sat in on a lot of batterers intervention groups. And in fact, just last week, I had a new piece come out in The New Yorker on um, battering interventions during COVID and what happens when your systems of accountability are all shut down, right? We have police are not making arrests and courts are not actively in session, at least here in the States. Yeah. Um, you know, probation and parole departments are all shut down. And so these in in the U.S. these batter intervention groups have all moved online, so they're all all on Zoom now. And for the most part, they have not. Bit, they can't make them mandatory once they're on Zoom, because some guys don't have, you know, the internet access, or they don't have, you know, phones, or that have the minutes, or whatever the whatever the reason is. And what they have found across the board is that about eighty percent of men still show up when they're not mandatory. That's so interesting. Is, it's really interesting, which is breaking like a fundamental paradigm about what we think about men, that they won't ask for help. Yeah. And um, so I think going forward, I mean, that obviously happened after I, I wrote my book. But the thing that I, I learned with sitting in on these men's groups is that they don't have a place where they can be vulnerable. They don't have a place um, where they can they can ask for help. You know, in the UK, you have a helpline for yep. for men. We don't have that in the US. You have a national like umbrella organization. We don't have that. Um, and of course, we have the problem, the added problem of guns. So uh, we have we have compounded issues here. And I think in some in some ways, you're really on the right track, right? You've got the phone number, you've got the coercive control laws now. You've got, I mean, you're you're working. Thanks you're working. Anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it. You know, we. I'm aspiring to be like the UK. I know <laughs> that's how that's how behind we are uh, here in the states. But, um, but I think, you know, I think we live in a culture that really celebrates. Um, male violence and i think it, it 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 keeps men limited in in their own emotional complexity and it doesn't serve them well either the patriarchy yeah. is not serving men right they they suicide is the number one killer of men in america between 18 and, and 34. that is a system and a culture that is not serving you well if that is your yeah i mean they they wind up in prison or dead, uh, you know, far too often. Yeah. And I think it was, what was sort of interesting and frustrating is that so many of the support initiatives for men that were being set up were, were, being, were so ad hoc as, a, you know, like this, it was kind of people with a passion, people with an yeah. understanding going in and demanding change, but actually yeah. how do we grow that? How do we kind of take that nationwide, but also it's so true. There is there is, prisons, you know, there is no life. funding, zero funding for men's programs. I mean, it's really, um, you know, we have we just send them away to prison, and there's no programming in prisons to try to, mm -hmm. you know, deal with them. There's no the restorative justice is underused. I mean, it's really it's really a huge gap in our system, and and not you know not just men but children. Yeah. We have, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but in the States, we have, you know, we have in along the Bible Belt in particular down in the southern states, we have stopped all, you know, reproductive rights, education, sex education, which includes domestic violence. And yeah. by the way, we're we're talking about turning No Visible Bruises into a young adult book, something that is for for young teenagers. Yeah, because 
you know, the, the, we see it happen. We see it happening with girls who are 13, 14 years old, and then the pattern becomes set. I mean, Michelle and Dorothy, the two women we've talked about, Dorothy met the man who would eventually kill her when she was 15. Michelle met the man who would eventually kill her when she was 14. Yeah. Must be intervening in the lives of these girls and, and young men. Sorry, I didn't mean Yeah. To, yeah. Because that's something Jimmy says in the book, isn't it? About how you have to reach men, boys when they're 12. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. yeah. How do you teach men to not be violent or something like that? You yeah. Know? You talk to them when they're 12. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's absolutely have, true. You have to start having these conversations because they're in relate, you, whether you're in, you know, romantic girlfriend, boyfriend relationships at that time, you're having relationships with girls and boys through friendships and, siblings mm -hmm. and people in your class and if you're learning so early on to dehumanize girls and to humanize women right then that's, if, if you don't catch that before that that's pattern of behavior is set then it's so hard to reverse it yep absolutely absolutely yeah i mean i'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll go to the the audience as it were in the in the question panel i know i'm kind of i'm kind <laughs> of like looking at a few of them i'm like oh that's great that's great that's guys saw yeah this is good you know um, um you have to you have to tell me which one so that we know we, we, well, we one was the one. working with kids so i got that in there for oh yeah that's good <laughs> <laughs> i did want to ask quickly about about gun violence because obviously mm -hmm. that is a, a a very different context in the states than it is here i mean you know guns are present in the uk illegally but not in in the legal context that you have. And I mean, it comes through again and again that that guns are such a big indicator of domestic homicide. And mm -hmm. I mean, how do we kind of overcome, what, what do we do about these relationships between shootings and domestic violence and also oh. domestic violence and mass shootings yeah. themselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean. I, <laughs> it's a million dollar question. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's like, yes, get rid of the guns. I mean, it's a very simple answer. It's not complicated, right? I mean, people always think sort of pro-gun people are like, well, we need to arm the women, right? <laughs> we need to we need to just have more guns on the streets, not fewer. And I, it just in any logical world, it just doesn't make sense, right? Like you don't, you <laughs> a gun in the home, the research is unequivocal. It doesn't matter who owns the gun. The gun in the home makes things more dangerous for women and, and really for men in suicide too. I would put forth that argument, but you know, you're asking when you arm women, you're asking them to inhabit the same sort of psychological dynamic of the abuser who has the gun for his own protection or whatever, whatever the reason is. Um, but part of my frustration is not just that this, this link between mass shootings and guns is so well known, but that March and April this year, during the beginning, you know, early days of COVID, we saw record gun sales in this country. And I had a, a police chief say to me, like, we're just waiting for the fallout. We're just waiting. Mm -hmm. And I did some reporting. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, little teeny tiny city, Milwaukee, is by the end of May, they were up to 58 homicides which is more than double what they normally have in a year. They normally have somewhere around 24 okay. at that time. And we don't, we're not going to have national stats until the fall of 2021 for this year, right? For the year of COVID. Yeah. But um, all indications, all anecdotal indications look really, really bad. And it just, it's, it's an America that I am recognizing less and less, you know, it mm -hmm. is, I mean, we, we had outlawed, you know, semi-automatic guns in the mid nineties. And, um, you know, our, our homicide rates plummeted. I just don't understand it. You know, instead of dealing with our gun problem, we, we want to send our kids to school with bulletproof backpacks. Like that's, that's a rotten society. Yeah. Like that is a society that's rotted from the inside out. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about about guns. You know, one other thing I want to say: we talk a lot about mass shootings and the connection between mass shootings, and and you see it in other places too that are not gun loving places. We've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in Australia, yeah. 
Um, and they all have deeply misogynistic histories, right? Yeah. Uh, most of them have domestic violence histories, but even if they don't have a known domestic violence history, they certainly have misogynistic tendencies that you can see in the things they leave behind, their writings and in their computer searches and things. Yeah. But there's another way that domestic violence and mass shootings is connected that I think doesn't get talked about enough, which is that there are the domestic violence perpetrators who become mass shooters who should have by all rights been in prison. And I'll give you just two examples. One is the Orlando Pulse shooter, Omar Mateen. You know, he was in Florida. He had strangled both his first wife and his second wife, which can under federal law carry a 10 year prison sentence. Instead, he was never charged, never served any time at all, and was then approved to buy guns. Same with uh, the Sutherland Springs shooter from the military. He had this mm -hmm. terrible background of domestic violence, but was never charged with anything. And then he goes into this church and kills 26 people. Yeah. So there's domestic violence intersecting mass shootings in so many different, different ways. It's really... Um, it's really frustrating is not the word that I want to yeah, use yeah. right here because it just feels like here's a problem and here's a solution and here's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, nothing. I mean, it's, it's, we see it here as well with the links between terrorism. And, and one of the things I wrote about a long time ago was just like, if we listen to women about domestic violence, then these, these terrorist attacks could have been prevented because if we, if we, if we take an action on those first offenses, recognize the violence that was was happening then then that, that person wouldn't have been in a position potentially i mean obviously there's all sorts of complications with that but sure. at least if you start from the position of listening to women you've got more of a chance right yeah. right absolutely yeah so i'm going to go to questions mm -hmm. um, so one of our questions is from jeanette Clum who asks, in the US, do teachers get training about recognizing the signs of abuse or domestic abuse in children? Oh, that's a good question. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, I can tell you, I mean, I'm a university professor. I've had no training in that, none. Um, but I, but you know, my, my whole career trajectory is different than what a middle school, uh, uh, a teacher trainer would have. And I, my sense is that we are so, um, we're such a country of states' rights that yeah. it would depend state by state. Like I would get, I would hazard a guess that in Massachusetts, they get some sort of training and in a place like, the, okay, I'm falling into stereotypes. I'm gonna get in so much trouble for this, but a place like Mississippi, they're probably not, or Arizona, maybe not. Um, and I, I would even say that it probably depends on uh, school districting, right? Because our yeah. our, ta our property taxes pay for our schools, and so some schools are are wildly wealthy public schools, and others are are not. But I will say, during COVID, I had an emergency room doctor when I was reporting this story last week for um, for the New Yorker. I had an ER doctor say to me that it was not the COVID cases in her emergency room that she was going to remember during this period of time. It was the child abuse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been such a huge issue, I think, of, of seeing this rise in uh, domestic abuse, child abuse, child neglect. Mm -hmm. And where it's not like, I mean, I wrote that it's not, it's not that the crisis has created the abuse, it's just created the circumstances where it's easier. To well, yeah, it. and it's also, cr it's created the circumstances where um, your third party systems or your third parties yeah. who usually report are not reporting. So yeah. in fact, really all across jurisdictions, both in the UK and the US, um, we're seeing drops in child abuse and that is not because abuse is not happening. Yeah. Because teachers and coaches and others are not able to call in. Um, yeah. I guess the issue of teacher training as well links back to what you said earlier around the kind of attacks on sex, and educa sex education and sex and relationships education mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. in, in certain areas of the states and from certain communities. Well, yeah, and you have, I mean, in those states, you have, at least in the U.S., a very strong religious, vocal, sometimes majority, sometimes minority, mm -hmm. um, and their their belief system is that women are subordinate. I mean, yeah. that, they teach that 
So of course they're not going to they're not going to want to teach about domestic violence because you were supposed to be obedient to your husband and yeah. you know et cetera et cetera et cetera. So um, I spoke in Dallas a couple of months ago before we all <laughs> were quarantined in our homes and they they were telling me like this is one of the biggest issues that we're facing today that domestic violence falls under the rubric of of um, sex education and we're not allowed to teach that in our schools now. Yeah. You know, Texas is a big state. It's a lot of kids. And it's really scary. It's scary that these conversations are, are sort of be becoming subordinate to, to these more traditional ideas about what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man. And we're seeing that um, in Europe at the moment, and there's been a big kind of backlash against gender studies courses, both in schools and universities. Oh, where, really? Um, yeah, in Hungary, the government shut down a gender studies course at one of the universities and currently in Romania, there's a petition to try and prevent the education law from banning gender studies. So we are seeing this kind of worldwide trend against these conversations, which we need to be fighting. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. We've got Sorry. a question from Linda Walker. You said, you mentioned looking into perpetrator programs. Did you find much evidence in that showed any long-term long change for perpetrators in the, you took part in these programs? Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing about abuser intervention programs, I mean, there's a couple things. Like, first of all, when you think about domestic violence, it, it really, it wasn't until the women's movement of the 70s that it even, you know, became anything close to what it is today. I mean, that's when we started building shelters. Mm -hmm. That's when we started to talk about legislation. Um, you know, uh, that's when, for example, you saw the first research coming out that said, that didn't say, well, if women are getting beating, beaten, they're bringing it on themselves. Like until the 70s, that's what, that's what the research said. It's that's why I that, right? Um, so batterer intervention programs, abuser intervention programs are even newer than that, right? Like some of, there was a smattering them around in the 80s, but it really wasn't until the mid 90s and the Violence Against Women Act here in the US. That they that they took off. So in terms of a social science, they're really really new, mm -hmm. right? Social science moves so slowly, and we learn so slowly. So I would say that that they're still in their infancy. I would also say that there's no because there's no funding for them. Um, you have a national certification system in the UK, but we all of our certification systems are at the state level. Mm -hmm. So we have some states that certify according to some criteria and other states that certify according to other. So it's very hard to do research when your control groups are probably all over the place and you're, yeah. you know, um, that's one problem that we have. Uh, I do, I actually really do think that they work. Um, I, I found one in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, just recently, it's not even in the book, but it's in this New Yorker piece from last week called the Alma Center, A-L-M-A. It is the most unique program I have ever seen for uh, like a hundred thousand reasons, but um, it, it's really, it seems to be really, really effective. And um, the woman who runs it is a woman named Terry Stradoff who's been doing this work for more than 30 years. I do think it works, but I think it works in the same way that AA uh, Alcoholics Anonymous works, right? In that like, there has to be this constant sort of vigilance. There has to be, first of all, the desire to change. And then there has to be the, from the abuser's perspective, they have to see what's in it for them, right? Just like an alcoholic. I mean, why, mm -hmm. why would someone stop drinking unless they saw what was in it for them to stop drinking? Um, I've always said like, why don't we have, a, you know, a buddy system like they have with AA? Like you have a, what is it? What is it called? The person that you call? Uh, you call sponsor. Sponsor. Your sponsor, yeah. You know, why don't we have that with batters intervention groups, someone who graduates and, you know, they become a sponsor to someone else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I mean, I think that again, it's a zero cost solution, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost anything. Um, I do think they work, but I think they are really all over the board, really. I think as well, like something that comes across in the book about this, the interventions is, 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 is there's just a whole of society as well, right? Like you, you, you go on these programs, but you come back into a violent, community mm -hmm. or in, in, your uh, incredibly impoverished community which means you very easy to slip back into old patterns of behavior and mm -hmm. you know and, and it sort of breaks your heart when you to see these 
these men who have done horrific, you know, horrific things, but have, have found some way of wanting to change, but then are stuck in these in these situations that make change even harder. Yeah. So I guess it yeah. goes beyond the program and there's the there's a guy in my book, Dante Lewis, who um He was who I was thinking of. Yeah, Dante, um I just love Dante. He was in prison for domestic violence, went through this program, um, got out of prison and became uh, an advisor to the program. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just seeing the comment, the Alma Center. I think it's the, I don't know if it's the Alma Center or the Alma program, but it is A-L-M-A, I just saw in the comments. And it's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so it's easy to find on the internet. Dante um, was a trainer. He was training to be a facilitator in this anti-violence program and was really doing well. And then he, um, he violated his probation. He was in a car and had a car accident um, and there was a gun in the car. And uh, so he went back to prison for five years and I caught up with him again in prison. And he was talking in the book. I talk about how he's saying like, no one else speaks this language, but me, I'm kind of all alone in here. Um, he got out in March and he contacted me as I suspected he would. He kind of always resurfaces. He's back in San Francisco where he's from. Um, of course, he got out of prison just in time to be quarantined for COVID. Oh, yeah. Poor guy. Um, so he's in he's in kind of a halfway house. And the first month or month and a half, he was doing great. He was happy to be out. He was on top of things. He didn't realize, like, how well the book had done and how far his story has, had traveled. He had never read the book because I couldn't get it to him. Yeah, yeah. So he had a big box of books, and he was really excited about it. And, you know, he's struggling now. It's yeah four months, going on four months, he's been out of prison, he's really struggling for exactly the reasons that you say, because he is surrounded by all the same forces that compelled him to act in that way the first time yeah. around. It is, it, no one said it would be easy. It was really not easy. And it really shows, again, this need for systemic change and also a change of how we value masculinity, what we think of masculinity. Yeah, yeah. And, and how we reconfigure that into a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. A question from Alison Gregory. She says, you've mentioned um, professionals and you know, the domestic violence advocates and the police, but I'm wondering what you found about the response of family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues as part of both the solution in terms of, I'm assuming, helping women, but also part of the problem in reinforcing negative behavior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes to both of those things. <laughs> Um, you know, it's interesting because people often ask like, what can I do? What can I do? And they get, you know, the families get exhausted, mm. right? Like people always say, well, just leave. Can't you just leave? Right. Why don't you just leave? And first of all, I can't think of any other crime where the impetus for change is on the victim, right? Yeah. Like yeah. your home gets burgled and the police come on and say, oh my God, this is terrible. Your home has been burgled. Well, the thief is going to take up residence here, but you have to leave, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. How, how have we come up with this as a solution? Um, and, and the fact is, you know, women leave all the time, which, you know, you can see in the book and you mentioned earlier. Um, and what I would say is that in, ca in cases like Dorothy Gunter Cotter, um, <coughs> sorry, I was trying to not drink from this big, gaudy, ugly bottle, but I can't help it. <laughs> Mm. Um, I should have a like a dainty, nice little glass. Like this. Oh, when you do events in in venues, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I forgot where I was. Oh, so so families get very like they get exhausted mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do. And I think part of part of that is because we don't we haven't been very good at listening to victims. We're very good at telling victims what they should do. Yeah. But we're less good at sort of just being there and letting them call the shots a little bit. And it's one thing I feel like that COVID is bringing up in, in conversation and is allowing people to interact. I saw a couple of comments about bystander interventions and things like that. And I think those are great resources. And I might even try to look at those later because I'm always looking for ways that, because I get asked this question a lot. Um, but I think COVID provides us a real opportunity to say to our neighbors or people in our community that we otherwise might not interact with as much to say to them, like, you know, I'm here if you need anything, maybe we can go on a socially distanced walk 
or something, right? Yeah. Um, I certainly have reached out to neighbors that I, I had, hadn't really spent any time with or met much at all, but they're the people who are around me now. And so I think it gives us a real opportunity to be able to just open up the space for people to talk. I also think we have to, you know, any domestic violence agency should include trainings for outsiders. Whenever they do a training for their own staff, I would, I would offer, see if you can offer that training to outsiders because, yeah. you know, the fact is Michelle's family, um, if they knew how to read the signs of what was going on in Michelle's, in Michelle's home and in her life, they would have, they would have reacted very differently, right? Like if they knew now, then what they know now, um, you know, victims go to clergy far more often than they go yeah. to domestic violence advocates. A clergy should always be trained, always. They should always be part of these domestic violence trainings that are in local areas. Um, I think I've lost the, the thread of the question now. But I think the thing about family is so interesting because there's something you say really early on in the book about how um, Rocky's behavior towards Michelle when he kind of comes to the house and he's banging on the door and how if that was a stranger, you you wouldn't think twice about that behavior being abnormal right. or threatening. But because right. it's a partner, you're just like, oh, they're just, it goes back to, that. it's just a domestic. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just mm -hmm. their way. And actually, if we did have this bigger understanding of what controlling behavior looked like, and families were able to identify that, or friends were able to identify that faster, yeah. then you would be more, I mean, I hate the word empowered, but it is the right word here, I think, of, to take oh, action. You know yeah, I kind of want to know why you hate it. I like it. I think it's just used a lot. It's used oh, a lot in so many different contexts. And it's like, is it actually yeah. the right word in this context? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like when people say literally and they mean figuratively. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's true. It's, it's, you think of control and isolation, for example, as things that are, that have a sort of emotional, um, vehemence to them right and mm. it, it, like abusers don't necessarily say you will not go out you will not see your family that's not how it happens right it's like this manipulation of like you know i know your family doesn't like me i just yeah. i you know makes me uncomfortable or I, you know i know your friend so and so doesn't like me i feel like she's going to say bad things about me to the kids i don't want her coming around here yeah. like that's how it happens it's things that are couched within the context of this is what love is yeah. Right. And we all assume, I mean, what's that movie with Robert Pattinson? Um, uh, Twilight? Twilight. I always get it confused with Hunger Games. I, it's neither one of them. I haven't seen either one of them. But, you know, he stands over Kristen Stewart's character watching her as she sleeps. And that is a message to our kids and our children that that is romance. Yeah. That that is a signal of how much he loves her. In fact, it's stalking and it's creepy and let's call it what it is, right? Let's change the conversation. This is why you need to turn this into a YA book. Yes. So people who read, yes. children that read Twilight, then read I'm Absolutely commit. You know, this is um, a little known fact. People always talk about, she's contributed to the New Yorker, blah, 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 which is great. But also I got my start writing for Seventeen Magazine. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, it's like Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue's leading the revolution right now. Teen Vogue is, they're amazing. They're doing amazing work. Absolutely. So, yeah. In fact, um, I'm hoping to write it, uh, the YA version of it with my, I should, probably shouldn't say this publicly, but whatever, um, with my, a woman who uh, is a dear friend of mine and was my editor at 17. So we both have oh, teen, teenage girl minds in our... <laughs> We did say we'd, we'd do 45 minutes and we've done 50, but oh, we're really? up for doing a, a, one final question from the audience. Oh, I'm fine. It's only, it's like not, it's just lunchtime here for me. So. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So we've got a question from Elaine, which is asking, did you see much evidence of intergenerational domestic violence? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's an easy question. I could say yes and leave it there. I mean, that's what's ha you know that's what's that's what people are saying around covid is that with the child abuse that we are not able to intervene in right now we are just grooming the next uh generation mm -hmm. of victims and abusers um i mean it it absolutely is crucial that we get that we get training for young people and that we get education for young people you know i will say one resource um 
the One Love Foundation. It's yeah. here in the U.S. It's it's Yardley Love, the young American woman who was killed by her lacrosse uh, estranged boyfriend. Her mother um, created the One Love Foundation, and they have. If you are looking for resources, looking for ways to talk to your kids, um, they have a really fantastic website uh, that I that I would highly recommend. Um, yeah, the intergenerational thing is violence begets violence. It's like mm -hmm. you know, people don't come out of prison uh, less violent than they go in. So, yeah, we've got a long road ahead of us. But you know, I love what what Gandhi always said: like, we're not we're not planting seeds for this generation. We're planting seeds for the next generation. You know, so that's what I think. You know, as, as I've been sitting here talking to you, my my twelve year old daughter is right here. I could like touch her little hand. She's just quietly sitting listening. And you know, I'm planting the seeds for her. Absolutely, and that was gonna be my last question. Really, is you know, there there are grounds for optimism, right? I mean, there's a yeah. lot of terrible things happening, <laughs> but 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 no, pain is also are. happening. There are. I mean, I do think I do think the Me Too movement, for example, has given us a kind of blueprint for how to talk about these things. Now, yeah. I would argue that the Me Too movement has lost a little bit of steam in the face of a global pandemic, and yeah, you know. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, you know, racial uh, uh, reform that is needed. That didn't come out right, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, so, hopefully, we can we can get back to it when there's a little more when there's a little more oxygen to to get back to it. But I do think we are learning and we're having hard conversations. And um, I think that that my book it has spurred some really great conversations. I. I I'm heartened by it. I'm really, I'm really thrilled. And we're having the conversations, which, which is it's so right. crucial because, I mean, I think that's where Me Too and again, like Black Lives Matter movement as well, mm -hmm. have been so crucial because it's triggered the fact that we we now will sit here with, it looks like 124 other people and have this conversation. Yeah. And, and you yeah. can't put that back in a back in a box. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely, happening. absolutely. I hope so. Yeah. And it doesn't take much. That's the takeaway. It doesn't take much. Yeah. It doesn't have to be expensive to, mm -hmm. to, to move bail mm -hmm. after lunchtime. Right. <laughs> That's something we can, that can be just done. Just that one thing of the 124 people who are listening, whoever's in charge of that in your own jurisdiction, just simple. We can get that started tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. It's been really, really brilliant discussion. And I mean, I did, I mean, it's it's such an important book. I think it's the most important book I'll have read all year, if not for many years. And as I say, it was, it's, it's got its harrowing moments, but it's got a lot of hope. It's got a lot of optimism. It's got a lot of laughter and inspiring women and inspiring men doing incredibly important things. Mm -hmm. Um, as yeah. I said at the start of the event, if you could sign up to the Bristol Festival of Ideas newsletter, then you'll be able to catch up with the next set of events that we're doing around these issues, as well as those of really fascinating talks about democracy and populism and the coronavirus crisis. You can buy a copy of Rachel's book using the link at the bottom of the screen and donations will be made to Women's Aid, um, Solace Women's Aid. And if anybody does need some support after this conversation, which I do understand may have been difficult for some people because these are live issues that many of us will have lived with ourselves, then the Domestic Abuse Helpline is open 24 seven on 0808 2000 247. And the number is also in the chat. But thank you so much. That's, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Thanks for having me. Talking about next, the issues. Next time in person. <laughs> yes, for sure, we'll make it happen. Okay, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming and dialing in and I hope you feel as inspired for change as I do. And thank you to Festival Ideas. <laughs>